to introduce our panel members. Um, we've got Ann Tran, and Ann Tran's a social media consultant who blogs about travel, inspiration, leisure, and social media. We've got Marilyn Terrell, and Marilyn is the chief researcher for National Geographic Traveler magazine. She's going to be talking about how to research your blog and, and some great tips on that. And then finally, we have, and, and straight in from Florida, uh, she moved her flight earlier to get here in time for the tweet up, uh, Carrie Gorgon, Carrie O'Shea Gorgon, and she is an attorney, a new media specialist, and an uh, educator in Florida. She's going to be talking about social media law and some things that happen when you're blogging that you might want to be aware of because of some changing, changes in social media law, which is pretty cool. So I wanted to talk to you about the contest, the photo contest, and that's why we have the cake theme. Um, so basically, I'm running a photo contest, uh, and the prize. Okay, and the prize will be this camera. Have you? Do you know about this camera? It's a Samsung Galaxy camera. I can post, tweet, um, Facebook, Google Plus, etc. From this awesome camera. So basically. It, you might want to read the rules carefully, but you can only enter one entry and have a picture of any of the Washington Monument with the cherry blossom in it. So Sabrina, have you met Sabrina? Sabrina Cake? She made the cake for us, and I don't know if you guys ha had a chance to take a close look at that uh, camera. It's pretty amazing. So huge thanks to Sabrina. This is her second time making cakes for us. Last month she made the social media, the social cake, social the social cake. cake. Uh, it was four layers of social media madness and uh, uh, a, a tab iPad tablet made out of Rice Krispie Treats on top. So uh, it was yummy and I'm sure that one will be amazing as well. We'll cut into that in a little bit. First up we have Marilyn. And as I mentioned, Marilyn is the chief researcher for National Geographic Traveler magazine. And she's got a lot of background. Her hashtag is actually, I mean, sorry, her Twitter handle is actually Marilyn underscore R-E-S for research. So she's like a research queen. And so we're going to have her answer some questions about about blogging and about research. So kind of to kick it off, Marilyn, you know, why is research so important for blogging? There are millions of blogs out there, and why should someone read your blog? I mean, think about the blogs that you read. Why do you follow certain writers? Uh, some people are good at being clever or funny or sarcastic or posting fabulous photos or cat videos, but most people go online to find reliable information from people who know what they're talking about. And if you want to be one of those people that people return to your blog, you ought to know what you're talking about. And how do you get knowledgeable about whatever, I mean, what's the best way to kind of get knowledgeable about a subject and what, are, what did you do when you were getting started? Uh, well, I, I'm mostly interested in travel blogging and uh, there are basically three steps, I think, in, in preparing a good travel blog. Uh, one is before you go, uh, two is when you're on the ground, and three is when you come back and you're uh, preparing to, to write a post. Uh, first off, the, the more you read, the, the better off you'll be. Uh, the more you read about a destination, and not just guidebooks. At National Geographic Traveler, we have, a, it's called the Ultimate Travel Library, that our editors have compiled a list of some terrific novels that give you a sense of place. Uh, a lot of these are really classic, like Patagonian Express, and some may be sort of obscure, but we have it organized geographically by country. So before you go to a country, you could look at our list and do a little reading. And the more you know, the better questions you can ask when you're on the ground. Um, then when you're, when you're on the ground, take lots of notes. Uh, you think you're going to remember, but you won't. And try to get the contact information for the people that you meet, uh, people that you photograph that you might want to use their photo on your blog post. Be sure to get a release. Have them sign a release because mm -hmm. that's important, I think, Kelly will say. <laughs> Carrie will say. Um, and then once you come back, um, try and pick an angle for your blog post. It's not really that interesting in travel blogging to just give a chronological, you know, what I did when I got up in the morning, what I had for lunch. Pick, pick an angle. Pick one encounter with somebody or, you know, a specific place that you went to that <coughs> really moved you and concentrate on that. Um, and then when, when you're preparing the blog, of the blog post uh, and you want to you know make sure that you're getting the facts right 
you can contact the people that you met in the destination um, and ask them follow-up questions and make sure you spell their names right. Um, what's the process you undertake for compiling and verifying a blog post? There, there are a number of uh, travel sites that we use. Uh, it's often hard to find the, the travel ministry for a country and so I always use TOWD, T-O-W-D, that's Tourism Offices Worldwide Directory and that, that way you can always be sure you get the, the government, you know, official website for that, for that country in terms of tourism. Um, I also use, um, well, Merriam-Webster's <laughs> Collegiate, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica rather than Wikipedia. Uh, Wikipedia is okay to get an overview, but always follow the footnotes and don't use Wikipedia as your only source. Um, I use uh, the State Department, um, NOAA, U.S. Geological Survey, National Park Service. Any government um, office website is tends to have more reliable information, census.gov. That, that's that. helpful. And so what are some, you mentioned one, and maybe one of them is uh, quoting Wikipedia, but what are some fact-checking uh, and research pitfalls that people fall into? And we've got... Oh, well, th th there are some, like, don't trust spell check because, um, because of homonyms, and those are words that sound the same, but they're spelled differently and they mean different things. So, I, and I see this very often, even from people who are good writers, but they'll say, you know, I hit the brakes and they'll spell it B-R-E-A-K-S or, you know, something like, uh, give, I'm pouring over these books and they'll spell it P-O-U-R. And these are just little things that, you know, you're, you may be factually correct, but if you make a little mistake like that, people will automatically doubt the accuracy of your information. So try and get someone else to read over your blog post. Even if you think it's perfect, just get another pair of eyes. It's amazing what another pair of eyes can pick up. Can you share one teachable moment that you've encountered around researching your blog? Maybe something that didn't quite catch or something that didn't go as planned uh, or one of the other bloggers for Traveler experienced? When you're in another country and you meet someone who's a good contact, Get them to write down their um, their email address, you know, correctly. And uh, what happened to me once when I was in Croatia, I got the phone number of uh, a guy that I had met. And when I called him up to verify some information, I asked him for his email address, um, and so I could send him an email. And I I copied it down, and it was like his name and monkey and the email provider dot com or something I kept trying kept bouncing back I didn't understand why I was bouncing back and I called him up again and I said this is what you told me he said yes and I said well where do you put the at sign and he didn't understand what I was saying finally he told me monkey is what we call the at sign in Croatia um, so that was fascinating to me <laughs> <laughs> we need a much better name here than the than just an at sign. We need a, the, the states needs a better name for their at sign. Well, actually, afterwards, because I'm a researcher, I had to find out what other countries call at signs. So I can tell you that in uh, Korea and Italy, they call it the snail. In Russian, they call it a dog or a puppy. Um, in Czech, they call it the roll mops, which is a way to serve pickled herring. Uh, Danish, it's it's the elephant trunk. Um, Dutch is little monkey tail, Finnish is meow marks, <coughs> Greek is duckling, Hebrew is strudel, I like strudel, um, Hungarian is worm, and Turkish is ear. What's the favorite place you've ever been to that blog that you've written about, a place you've been to that you've blogged about? One place that I went that I really enjoyed was I went down the Yukon River in, in Canada, and <coughs> while I was going down the river I was reading this history by Pierre Burton, who's like the ultimate historian for that part of the world, and um, it was it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Marilyn shared with us some thoughts on researching a blog, and and again being credible because you want people to keep coming back to your blogs. Um, one question that uh, you know now, Anne Anne's kind of a social media you know a consultant and specialist and guru, if I might say, and she's worked a lot to get a lot of eyes on her blog. So 
Um, and you want to share with us some of the thoughts about your blog and what it means, um, you know, to have a blog on your website. When you have, you know, your social media pages, that's your web presence. So obviously your website, that's your web presence. So you want to have consistency ac across, you know, your social media pages. And I wouldn't call myself a guru. Um, <laughs> I track that. Learning every day. And you would think with all my following, I wouldn't have a team of retweeters, right? So how many of you guys blog and how many of you have retweet team? Does anyone have a retweet you, team you know that blogs? Retweet team is? We've got two folks with a retweet okay, team. So for those who don't have a retweet team and that do not blog, you might want to consider recruiting and forming your own team. So back to the 10 folks. So I sent it out and the 10 folks shared it. So these people have different, different fan club. So, you know, you're going to have a different reach, a different pool. So within, I think, eight hours plus, it was over 200 retweets. And um, the wow part was the, for me personally, was the stumble pond. Who uses stumble pond here? Yeah, that is powerful. And I... Well, Anne, can you explain it for those that don't, sure. what, quickly that's what stumble pond is? That's a site where all the bloggers share their blogger. That's one of the sites anyway. So you throw it into this little thing, it breaks your link, and if you look, go look at my page, it'll say SU dot something, which is a stumble upon. And then if you look at the link on the top, it will have the advertisement of stumble upon. So I just only sent it to 10 folks. And I also use that to do a favor when you like a blogger's blog. I do that as a favor and I stumble it for them as well, not just my own. Um, so you go out the extra mile to help your other bloggers because in return you're going to create a team without realizing it. And I'll, t I'll cover that in a second. So on my stumble pond for just the contest alone, I looked it up and the average of the other blogs that I had stumbled that day was like maybe 1,500 to 2,000 clicks. For that one, it's, it was kind of interesting because I was trying to figure out what was it. Was it the title? So it had the word spring. It had the word cherry blossom. It had the word contest, right? So I guess, you know, maybe that is popular around now. It had 12,000 hits, uh, clicks, I mean. And I was like, wow. So stumble upon, you just throw it in there. It's like a jackpot. You don't know what's going to come back out. It's pretty cool, actually. So back to the part with just trying, not only getting your stuff out there, get other people's stuff out there. Um, so for example, I realized so she just got a brand new job, right? <laughs> So, um, do you want to talk about a little bit before I talk to about your post that you uh, about your new job? Just joined Group as the VP Digital Marketing, and it's a very interesting story because it's almost like a it's almost like a social connection. I met uh, my boss uh, two years ago when I was speaking at a conference. Uh, she came to the panel that uh, I was uh, speaking at. And we kept in touch through LinkedIn for a couple of times. And last December, I was looking for a blog. Uh, I was researching for a blog post for the Washington Business Journal. It was called like CEO blogs in the DC area to follow. And as I was doing that, the, fir uh, uh, the first five blogs was Tom Bozuto, who owns the, is the owner of the company that I work for now. And then I said like, look, let me look at their website. And uh, I went and since I knew Jamie Gorski, I connected with her once again and that's how I got this job. But uh, the announcement that I made was on uh, my personal blog, which said like, a salute and a journey forward, which I was saying like I was leaving Natural Solutions and joining Bazuto. But it, uh, the community really uh, saw that post and said that, look, we've got to do something for Shashi and I really appreciate the fact that a lot of people retweeted it. The people that I connected with in Washington Business Journal and the Washington Post actually carried it and Tran uh, retweeted it, which got me like at least in 100, 100 other people touching that. So uh, I think I would like to thank the community and you. And Not only do you want to promote your blog, but you want to help promote other people's blogs. So when I found out that he just got this brand new job, you know, uh, here's the trick. If you want to get someone's attention or you just want to share someone, so I took his blog, I shared it on Facebook, Google+, uh, Twitter, all my platform. So if you want to help others, others will in return help you. And 
it's amazing. Uh, I sent out a post, and I have no idea why this one individual, because I knew had a, he had a retweet team, because my, my post kept going around and around and around. And it was like 100 retweets, right? And I've never asked this guy to do it. So this is the power of networking here. You, if they like you, they just do it, right? But the funny thing is, a retweet does not always mean a retweet. And what do I mean by that? So I look at my video and my post, and it had like 200 retweets. So you would think the video should match with the retweet, correct? Well, I looked at it, I'm like, well, the meat of the post is the video. There are 200 retweets and only 50 views. So obviously it didn't get viewed. So you kind of have to play with that. So when you have a video, make sure you share the video separately so you can get a balance. When you share on Google Plus and Facebook, make sure you pick the right photo. That is essential. So I just wrote a post recently about uh, how to be the life of us at a social media party. And I used the cocktail metaphor. And uh, my photo of what I picked was okay, but the post went really far. It's very popular. It resonates with the audience. But when I saw Sean pick out this really cool picture, it had all these cocktail uh, glasses, but each glass represent each social media platform. So that drew my attention. I want to click on that. Make sure that you pick the right photo because, you know, like Marilyn had mentioned earlier, there are like hundreds and thousands of blogs, right? What makes me want to click on your blog? Well, the photo is really important. And I don't know if you know if you guys use Google Plus, but it's really important that you use it. Um, I know that you know getting other people involved in your blog is a great way to get it shared. So you want to talk a little about the series that you're doing and how that kind of helps get the blog out there as well. Right. So what I have is it's one of the popular uh, series. I feature ten people, and then I pick a question. And blogging seems to be really popular. So you pick a question, and I was a brand new blogger at the time, and I didn't feel that I was equipped to cover all the arena, so I rec recruited 10 other folks um, to help me. So you have 10 different angles, 10 totally different perspectives, and that carries your blog much further, plus you got those bloggers helping you get your post out there, you know? So it's a win-win for everyone. Okay, so let's say you, have the, you think you have the perfect title for the blog, and it's got great content, you've got a cool picture, and it's just not moving. It's just not getting the attention that you wanted. And you did put the you know due diligence into sharing it. You know what, what do you what do you do? And let's say your retweet team couldn't even get it out. What what else do you do to get it moving? Yes. So when you do titles, make sure you like come up with a few titles. And I actually have a few editors as well. Make sure it gets through goes through a couple edits. Okay. And um, have them come up with three titles, and you pick the best one. Sometimes it, you think you have the best one. You think that's the one. Well, it doesn't go anywhere. So pay attention to your uh, Twitter feed or uh, at messages. The person will copy and paste a piece of your post and say, wow. And they said, this resonated with me. So I use that as my new title. This one lady really loved the quote. And the quote did it for that blog. So I retitled it and posted on Facebook. Uh, you can't change the title once the, the post is live because you're going to break the link and you're going to lose all the retweets. But what I did was I reposted it with a new photo, with a new, you know, the quote, and it went far. How often and for how long do you promote the same blog post? Once I post it out there, doesn't mean you all saw it because you're not all on, this, uh, on Twitter at the same time. So you're not going to see it, right? So I reschedule it, uh, different date, different time. And the most popular one, like the seven ways to get retweeted, is like seven different points, really short, succinct, and simple. I'll reschedule it uh, by quarterly, by monthly, just depending, because you don't want to bore the audience too. So you kind of have to gauge your audience. But I recycle my posts all the time in different platform. Because let's say I put it on Google over a year ago. I don't have the same followers I had a year ago. They're new followers, so they're going to want to read it. All right, again, Carrie's in from Florida to join us. So that's really exciting. I know, it's very uh, very cool to have out of state guests. Chili, I was not prepared for that. I know, it was 20 I degrees was below the normal high or cold. something like that today. No, I'm, I'm from Boston. I'm gonna be using some language that a seven year old can understand because I brought a seven year old. And that's the test I used to do. I'm a lawyer by trade, so when I would do litigation, I'd sit in the cab and explain my case to the cab driver. He was like, that case sucks. 
I was like, I have a problem. So um, now I teach and I blog, and so I need everyone to understand what it is that I'm saying. So if only he were paying attention, I would have a really good... You're not as engaging as that device yeah. right One there. thing I just figured out is I'm doing like everything wrong. So it's really good that I came tonight. <laughs> I don't know why anything I write gets shared, but I write a lot about social media law and analysis. I try to make it link juicy. And I put a lot of resources in there. Right now, I'm still geeking out over being mentioned in the New York Times, and the post that got mentioned was called, You're Creeping Me Out, The Dark Side of Social Networking, right? Now, what are some, you know, things that bloggers need to think about when posting in their blog, specifically around, you know, Anne's got a contest going on, and what are some of the tricky areas for blogging um, and bloggers out there? Contests are tricky all around. For one thing, I always recommend avoiding games of chance at all costs, because there is one lottery, it is state run, you are not permitted to compete, okay? So lotteries are a no-no. And what makes something a lottery is if somebody gives you consideration, so something of value in exchange for a chance at winning a prize. The trick is this, it might be giving money for a ticket, which is what you would probably think of, but it could also be filling out a survey, or giving you a retweet, or doing something simple that a marketer would naturally ask for. That's not permitted in the majority of states. So um, try to avoid pure games of chance unless they are strictly no purchase required. And like, why would you do that? Because then you don't get anything out of it. Wait, so what, ch so what do they replace it with? A contest of skill. A challenge of wits. No, um, anything, so provided that you have some assessment of skill involved in your contest, so it could be the best, most creative retweet or the most aesthetically pleasing photo and you explain to them exactly how that's going to be gauged and who is going to do the deciding, everything is fine. Okay, because now there's skill, there's no more element of chance, right? So everything is, is on the up and up and you've avoided the state regulations on um, lotteries and illegal lotteries, which are a headache, to put it mildly. So. I can imagine. Any other con things when it comes to content or you know, in blog posts that people should be aware of that there are laws associated with. I mean, co I mean obviously copywriting and things like that as well. Yeah, only like everything. Um, <laughs> pretty much everything. Just don't write if you want to be totally safe. And then I can promise you won't get sued, you know, for stuff that you don't do. No, I mean, he's seven and he understands that taking somebody else's stuff is wrong and will get you into trouble. So um, basically I've seen cases where somebody will scrape content from somebody else's blog, and just the whole thing. And it's so odd. It's like the blog's about being a single mother and some dude scrapes the blog. And you're like, <laughs> I think people know, you know what I'm saying? But more importantly, you know, you can't avoid getting sued. I mean, I could never guarantee that you'll never get sued because everybody gets sued all the time. It's, it's just something people do for fun and with, for a chance at money. But if you do the necessary things to minimize the likelihood that they will win, you know, people being self-interested by nature for the most part won't sue because they don't want to waste money. So, provided you own the rights to what you publish, or you have permission to publish, you're going to be, com you're going to be for the most part, fine. So consider that. Um, and also consider defamation. That's when you say something about someone else that could damage their reputation, um, that can get really sticky. And we'll almost guarantee that you get sued. And in the UK, it's, it's much, much worse than it even is here. So you have to be especially careful if you're a UK blogger, which I don't know if anybody um, following is, but it's very dicey there. So just be careful when you're saying something negative about somebody else and you're not 100% for sure if it's true, like you weren't there, you didn't witness the animal abuse or whatever it is, just don't say it. And what are some things we need to think about when you've been compensated and you're writing about it? There's nothing wrong with wanting to earn a living blogging. I mean, that's, what, that's the gold standard right, for people now. You want to get ideally compensated for blogging. The trouble arises when it could be said that you're misleading someone into thinking that your opinions you're stating are purely from a disinterested vantage point. So if I get a great camera and I get it for free, for example, and uh, I talk about how great it is, but I never disclose that I got it for free or that they're paying me to say that, then that's a problem. On March 12th, the FTC finally clarified their guidelines for bloggers and other people in relation to sponsored posts and disclosure. And they just kind of closed up a lot of loopholes that people were using because originally um, there wasn't social media really at that time. And so they were like, people were like, but you know, Twitter, it's like so short, I can't, uh, sorry. There's no time to disclose. Well, you have to. And um, what the FTC has said, not only do you need to disclose if something is sponsored, and that means anything. It could mean swag, it could mean you've been paid um, for specifically for this post, or it could mean that you have like an ongoing sponsored relationship, which by the way is like a super, super thing. But you have to disclose it every single time you're making a claim relating to something.
every single time. How do every you do tweet. that in, in Twitter when you have 140 characters? I know, it's so difficult. And um, they've actually closed a little loophole where people would tweet like a series of things and have the disclosure on one of them and say, well, that's great, you know, we disclosed. But no, you can't guarantee that people will see them all and you can't guarantee that they will see them in order. So it's necessary to disclose in every single instance. What you can do is tweet like a, a teaser ad or something that goes to uh, a link where you make the claims about the product and describe it and everything. But then you're going to have to disclose on that page where you go equally as prominently as where you talk about how great the camera is, is the disclosure that you received it for free. So that's the trick there. It's, really, it's four Ps because I wrote them on my hand on the airplane on the way <laughs> with my son. Uh, placement, proximity, prominence, and presentation order. So placement and proximity means that the disclosure you need to make has to be right next to the great claim about the camera, like right next to it. It has to be equally as prominent. So it can't be in the boilerplate. It can't be just a nondescript, like shortened URL. It has to be visible. And the presentation order means they have to see it before they click order or put it in the cart. So ideally, you need for them to have seen it, okay, and take action, you know, before they take action. Um, and it's tricky because you now have an obligation to monitor the analytics on that disclosure and see if people are actually looking at it or not. And if they're not, you have to figure out why. I mean, secretly inside, you're doing a little dance like they're not reading it, cool, right? But you have to fix that. Like, you're responsible for that now. So, yeah, it's, it's a little bit crazy. Anything in specific that you want that you want to, um, you know, kind of target in on about the updated FTC.com disclosures? that affects social, mobile, and digital advertising? Anything else that stood out to you um, from I'll tell you one thing. They understand completely that you're in a difficult spot when you're talking about small screens. And their solution is to make you use responsive design. And take into account the fact that if people are going to look at what you're disclosing, what you need to disclose, what you're promoting on a small screen, you need to make sure that they're seeing that disclosure on that small screen. That's now become your problem. And if you cannot do that effectively, then you're going to need to just not use the platform. That's can, their can solution. You, quickly, for those who might not know, what you know, can you explain what responsive design is? Oh yes, I'm sorry, I'm a nerd. It's my, <laughs> it's my disclosure. So now that that's covered, hashtag nerd, um, law nerd. That's even worse. Yeah, basically, um, a responsive web design is coded so that it looks good on every device and every browser. So you no longer have the problem where oh, it's broken in Firefox. So every, it will look good everywhere. The trouble is, making it look good might make it small, right? And it might kind of lop off things off the sides. And people will have to kind of scroll to see them. They can't, if they have to scroll too far to see your disclosure, you're going to have to make visual cues telling them, hey, there's important stuff down here. Keep going. Keep going. Right. Yeah, you have right. to do that now. That's important. Uh, I want to, we're, we're coming up on our time, but I want to ask one quick question of all three of you. Uh, we have a lot of folks here that blog, some that don't. I have a website set up, but I have not written my first blog yet. So uh, if you were to speak to a first time, or a blogger who's just wanted to get started in their blog, what is one piece of information that you would want them to have, or one piece of advice that you'd want them to have? as they're getting started? I would say write something that you know about definitely and write something that you're passionate about because it's going to come out from your piece. That's great. Thanks, Anne. Um, <clears throat> I, I would say to read other blogs on the same topic and comment on those blogs if you have something interesting to say. People love comments that are not spam and they really appreciate it and they'll find out where you're from because you'll leave your uh, email address and your URL so then they'll go to your blog and discover you and this actually happened um, when uh, our magazine National Geographic Traveler was starting its blog um, it was not even on a blogging platform it was really small and very ad hoc and I started following other travel blogs and leaving comments and uh, one travel blog uh, that called Grid Skipper that used to be owned by um, Gawker, they've since sold it. Um, I was following a, a travel blogger there, made a comment on his blog and his name was Andrew Evans. He looked me up and said, oh I see you're a travel blogger in DC, I don't know too many other bloggers, let's get together for lunch or coffee. And he's since become um, the digital nomad for National Geographic Traveler, travels 250 days a year oh, and cow. blogs and tweets all over the place. That's great there advice and very helpful. I would say, um, I'll take actually a page from Mark Schaefer's books. I write for him and I was doing all those law posts and everything 
and he said, Carrie, I'm happy with you doing this. You're reporting. It's useful information. I will be able to syndicate the heck out of it. And if you do it forever, I'll be happy. But if you really want to break out, you need to infuse your posts with a heartbeat. You need to write a post that only you can write. And that's when I wrote the, the creepy guy one. <laughs> and, and you made New York Times with this. So that's, that was good guy. advice. Mark, you should thank Mark for that advice. Let's go ahead and give our panelists a round of applause for their time. And a round of applause to Sabrina uh, for her cake and staff for live tweeting. Yay.